Thumbs up. Let's do this. Let's do this. Good morning, Justin. Good morning, Mr. Mark. How are you? Oh, uh, I am well. I am blessed. Just, just enjoying the morning. Lizzie turns 21 today. 21 today. 21. When you hear this. Yeah, sure. <laughs> wish her happy birthday. And she'll right. be like, what? Because it'll be some weeks later. But exactly. But yeah. Yes. Just uh, 21. Man. Yep. Just sitting in the blessing of uh, 21 years ago. Mm-hmm. And, and you can't tell. Maybe you can hear it in his voice, but Mark got a beard trim and a haircut. <laughs> so if he sounds a little fresher. I, I feel fresher. I feel stronger even. Yeah. Yes, you look stronger and fresher for sure. Well, well thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you. I'm yeah. just sitting up a little taller this morning. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And you're also kind of, seems like a little excited to talk about this topic. I am. I am. It's, uh, as we, as I've wrestled, thought, read, you know, the stuff we try to do, uh, to, uh, promote it's i've i've grown in my fear of the lord in that awe sense Mm. in that process Uh, of being fearfully and wonderfully made it's just kind of a it's it's a it's been a neat overwhelming kind of yeah from an information and yeah it's just been really neat Welcome to How I See It with me, Mark Pratt, and Justin Sternberg. This is a podcast that works to counter cultural polarization through thoughtful conversations. And what is this topic we're going to talk about? Well, (laughs) because I said one thing and you said, you sure we're not talking about this other thing? (laughs) I'm going to tell you right now, Justin, I'm going to need your help this morning. (laughs) Otherwise, we might end up in the tall weeds because like you say, we're, uh, what was, what was the one you, you were talking about? Neural pathways. Neural pathways. Correct. Yeah. And I'm also curious too, if you've. Because I brought this up to you, said I think we should talk about this, mm-hmm. but I didn't really think about it in terms of whether it's a polarizing topic or not. Because I mean, it's not exactly, but okay. oh, it is. Okay. It is very polarizing. Ah, right. Right within our scientific community, it becomes very polarizing. All right. Well, that's what we're going with then. <laughs> this is a very polarizing topic in our scientific community. <laughs> Tune in. <laughs> yes, but it's interesting because um. <clears throat> Uh, as you as we talk about neural pathways, I uh, I view neural pathways kind of like a um, <laughs> I used to call, used to say the word creek, but it is a creek. I used to call it crick. That's what it was. Crick. Yeah, yeah it's kind of like a creek. Mm-hmm. And but it's not a crook. It's not a crook. That's right. <laughs> and I am not a crook. <laughs> <laughs> and it, but that's it's a not, really old school joke. It is, but uh, it's not a crick. But it's <laughs> a creek. Right. Like that goes through and mm. and it flows. Yep. And it has a purpose. I don't know what that was, but <laughs> it, it has a purpose. And until we either change that flow by doing something different mm-hmm. or we experience trauma, which may overflow that bed, okay, we it becomes that's that's kind of the a pathway just like a path and and through the grass yes it it becomes the way that our um like i say there's a, there's electromagnetic process you know that that's where it flows so that's essentially it. that's the the metaphor for neural pathways right sure it's that creek in our brain that kind of that's flows a- where it's going <clears> to <throat> flow without interruption it will continue right like that yes yeah. Yes, because it has a purpose. And if that purpose changes, or if I change my thoughts regarding that purpose, then that's when that process changes. And changing my thoughts, okay, is what we're talking about as far as neuroplasticity. And that's our brain's ability to be malleable. And that's where it comes back to from a science perspective, there was the the process that our brain is above our body. In other words, our we can't think anything differently than what our brain was pre-programmed to do. 
Does that make sense? That's the that's a viewpoint you're saying. That is a viewpoint. Okay. That's a that's a polarizing viewpoint. Mm -hmm. That basically our brain, we are born and our brain is pre-wired. So therefore it minimizes or even can um negate free will. Mm-hmm. So that's that's it's, like the nature side of nature versus nurture. To a degree, yes. Fair? Yes. Maybe. Okay. Yes, because what happens is I don't really have a choice. Mm -hmm. But if we're able to recognize free will on the other side of that process is my thoughts matter. Mm -hmm. And that's where that's where epigenetics comes into play. All right, let's hear the definition <laughs> of that one. It's not etymology because we covered that one a few weeks that's ago. That's right. But epa, epa. Give me the etymology of ep. <laughs> But to epi, how do I say it? Epigenetics. Epigenetics. Okay. Let's have it. Epigenetics. Okay. Epa meaning the top or above. Mm. Okay. Like our epidermis, yep. that's the top layer, our skin. Mm -hmm. Okay. So epigenetics is that my thoughts or my mind is above my brain. Okay. Yeah. The brain isn't the mechanism. Hmm. The 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 epigenetics is that there is this process that's above genes. Hmm. So for so long, and and still in our science community, the tendency is to think about it in the sense of genes. Mm -hmm. So because they're like the blueprint, right? I mean, that's the concept. That that's that's part of it. To where if okay. we can isolate that gene. Okay. Yeah. Then we can change the the process, if you will. Yeah. yeah. And and what happens? Epigenetics basically says no. There's a process above that. Okay. So the way that I think the and and it, I've been I've reminded so much of Mary Ellen and Mary Beth mm -hmm. in this because even even the food that we consume can change part of our genetic process. Mm -hmm. And the thoughts we have can also change that to where who we are is according to much, much as we've developed our understanding and the ability to measure what happens in the brain and how it works and how it flows you know, we're able to recognize that 90% of who we are, okay, not so much from a, um, a physical standpoint, but yes, even our physical being, you know, is controlled by our thoughts. Mm. And the, mm -hmm. and this is, this is the neat part to me because what part of my brain structure or my gene mapping, if you will, is actually passed through my sperm and the ova. Mm -hmm. It's able to pass through that in what is communicated to the next generation. And yet we recognize in that 90%, okay, it's not that that person is destined Okay, because they still because of what has been passed on to them, because they still have the ability of free will to make choices regardless mm -hmm. of the map that has transcended the sperm and the ova. Does that make yeah, sense? It does make sense. Um, so everything yeah. in scripture that basically says children to the third and fourth generation, okay, is absolutely true. Mm -hmm. You know. Much of many things are passed on through the family systems, and yet the individual still has free will to choose. Mm. So, therefore, they have the responsibility to choose. So, the aspects of good DNA or, you know, good genes, she has good genes, mm -hmm. or he was born that way, are actually a myth. Yeah. Well, they, they're not a myth in the sense that there's nothing to it, right? Is that correct? It's, in other words, it's passed through. Yes, it, it, it is passed through, but that doesn't mean that that's who that person right, right. is yes. Yes. as far as a destined. As a defining. Yes. Yes. 
Yeah, I think that's incredible and obviously something that feels intuitively true to me based on like being involved in recovery for a long time and sure. seeing people who share their stories of this is what I was and this is what my parents were and this is what their parents were and now sure. I'm not that, you know? Yeah. And in the course of one lifetime, kind of breaking that chain. Yes. You know? Yes, exactly. Yeah. And the, the the neat part of it is we're, this is what kind of brings up the awe part for me is that this is new science. This is, mm. you know, cutting edge. In other words, you know, we always uh, talked about it, even with our kids. It's like, yeah, you know, you got to take this class. You got to, you know, you got to have these complex classes mm -hmm. because it challenges your ability to think because there's jobs that aren't even made yet that you might be a part of. You right. follow me? Yep. It's like, when am I ever going to use this critical thinking right. stuff? Well, and it, it, it reminds me of that because in reality, I think, you know, neuroscience is part of that to where there are, you know, with this information, jobs are being created and, you know, that we've never heard of before. Mm -hmm. But the reality of it is, I believe thinking is, thinking is a God given ability. Okay. And in, in my, from my perspective, it's what makes us most like God. And our ability to do that or how he has created us with that process is probably next below. Well, yeah. So go ahead. The, uh, the thing that does that, that, that kind of is the defining characteristic is when you can think about your thoughts. Yes. Right? And so we can. Right. So that's the difference between, you know. I mean, you could argue that maybe a dog is thinking, you sure. know, whether they should disobey or obey you or whatever, you know, whatever, yeah, yeah. whatever animal. And there's some intelligent animals, but can you imagine looking at a chimp as he's, you know, you know, plucking <laughs> flies out of his friend and eating them or whatever? Is he thinking existential thoughts about his thoughts? Uh, sure, very unlikely. We, I mean, yes, <laughs> there's no, there's no proof of that anyway. But that is definitely the defining characteristic, I think, when it comes to the difference between us and the rest of creation and what makes yes. us like God is that. And that is this thing. Yes. Right? That is what makes all the difference. That ability to think about your thoughts means you can know, in many ways, control those thoughts. Yes. Redirect those thoughts, which using your creek analogy. And right? we, exactly. And we, we can't control you know, things, but we can choose our response to them. Right. And that, right. and, and it, it just, when we really stop and think about that, I'm reminded of myself or in, when I listen at times to others, how often you can hear a person's thoughts in what they're saying and yet it's not until we say it out loud that we realize, oh, that's what I was thinking. You follow me? Yeah. In that, you know, how many yeah. times we've yeah. referred to, I can't. Mm. How many times a day would we likely say that? And how does that impact who yeah. we are? Yeah. And it's, I mean, it. Yeah, you're probably the same way maybe with your kids, but that's always been a pet peeve. When <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, excuse me? Yes. <laughs> uh, if you say that, then you won't. And you, yeah, it's true. You know, it's kind of that self-fulfilling sure. thing, right? Yeah. But, yeah. And so that's, that's, that's where the epigenetics part, above genetics, in other words, yes, we mm. pass on these genes and we, we have received them. And yet... That's not who we have to be because our thoughts can change our DNA structure in such a way. And, and it basically comes down to even differences between toxic thought and how that affects our ability. And it, it, the, here again, I'll just, just, just give me a little chain here, but feel free to pull back if <laughs> I, I will. Can. Um, and I, I think about it in the way we think. Okay. And how the way we think affects our body. Okay. Yes. And for example, if we were to go back 12 years and say, for example, you are experiencing depression, 
you know, that kind of thing, you would have been given, you know, what we'd call an SSRI, mm -hmm. um, selective, this is the word I like, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's that the, sounds familiar. That, exactly. So this is the interesting part because what, what we are, if I may say, and this is nothing against medication. Okay. But this is what we are learning. This is what we are understanding now based on science is that 12 years later, what I'm going to prescribe for you from a therapeutic standpoint doesn't have to be an SSRI. Hmm. I'm going to, I'm going to prescribe to you something that's very similar to prayer. Hmm. It's going to be called meditation, mm -hmm. okay? And I'm going to recommend that you can control your thoughts. And when you find yourself heading down that, I'll call it negative rabbit hole, mm -hmm. I'm going to challenge you to take that thought captive. Mm -hmm. That's going to sound much like scripture. Mm -hmm. You yeah. follow me? Yes. And I'm going to be able, mm -hmm. and we're going to be able to recognize as you select if I may, your thoughts, you're able to transform your thinking and, and where, how you create that same level of serotonin in your own brain. Hmm. You follow me? Yeah. And the reality of it is it's like in scripture, we can look back and how often are we reminded to take our thoughts captive, to renew our mind. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because now science is actually catching up with scripture. Yes. yes. That, that is exciting. And honestly, that's exactly. So th this Sunday, the message we had, you know, it's the last sure. message in a series called pre-decide. Sure. Right. So pre-decide right there. We're talking about taking thoughts captive basically we're pre pre meditating on decisions essentially right sure and um you know we read from Romans 12 1 and 2 which I'm going to read which we don't ever we always I just you know do paraphrase, our, paraphrase. sure yeah, we're, I'm going to read one okay uh, so Romans 12 1 and 2 says I appeal to you brothers by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God which is your spiritual worship and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Mm -hmm. That might that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And you know we, we went through that and kind of he taught through that scripture a little sure. bit. But my brain was just worrying as I was thinking mm -hmm. about you know this renewing of our mind. Yeah, like you just said, my I was thinking. Science is starting to catch up with this concept. Yes. That these neural pathways, this neuroplasticity in our brain, there's this ability for our brain to be transformed. Yes. To be renewed. Yes. Right? And there's there's starting to be scientific proof of that and um, like you said, like actual methods for accomplishing that. And when you find out what they're saying, hey, we, we're finding out these methods work to carve new paths and that those yes. creeks in your brain, they look a lot like prayer. They look a lot like yes. meditation. They look a lot like surrender. Yes. Right? And uh, so I just thought that was incredible. And I was just thinking about how, you know, a lot of times we can't get out of our existing patterns, that creek bed. Yes. If we're... We can't. If we're in it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, you know, I think we talked about this before. I think it's an Einstein quote. You can't solve a problem from mm -hmm. the same level that you created it. Sure. Right? So if you're stuck in that same pattern, you have to surrender out of it, mm -hmm. which is why I really like, you know, basically that scripture is kind of the method to accomplish mind renewal, which is sure. first offering your body a living sacrifice, this idea of surrendering what you think you know. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. to, your, to a higher power, someone who is above the level that you are. Sure. Right? And then allowing his word sure. to come in and give you new ideas. Sure. Right? Yeah. And as that happens, mm -hmm. your brain starts carving new paths going, oh, oh, I can trust him in this situation instead of yes. trying to control it. Or, you know what I mean? I do. And my mind was just like thinking about all these things in terms of, yeah, this neural, these neural pathways and stuff. And if I can trust him in this area, I can probably trust him in that right. area. So now- And that area. Right. And that area. Your creek is starting to diverge into these other 
new yes. you know, waterways or whatever that were never there before. Exactly. Right? And that's and that's neuroplasticity. Our brain's ability to rewire, reconfigure, to be malleable in such a way that I can be a completely different person. Yeah. It's incredible. It is. And it, it, it's interesting because we know, you know, we've known where parts of these things happen in the brain early on previously. Like, well, if I may, it, early on, um, we understood uh, Phineas Gage, mm -hmm. okay, um, was a minor. Okay. I really like Phineas and Ferb. Yeah, understood. I'm just saying. <laughs> Not the same Phineas, okay. but he was a minor. Long story short, he was a supervisor and he had a rod. I think it was a brass rod that he would tap. Maybe it wasn't brass, but either way, he was a miner. He would tap the drilling holes when they blasted in the mines. Long story short, he tapped his rod into one of those blasting holes and it set off a blast and it shot that rod up through below his eye cavity and out through the top of his brain. Ooh. Okay. Ouch. Ouch. But he lived. Okay. So he was like the first example. It's unbelievable. Yes. So a rod went through like his face. Right. Below his, his face. Like came, yes, up through the front, what we call the prefrontal cortex wow. of his brain. Okay. And he lived. So this was, this was like miraculous. Yeah. Because somebody had experienced a brain injury and lived. But what we know about who Phineas was, was he changed dramatically because of that experience. Hmm. Okay. Prefrontal cortex basically is our where our executive function takes hmm. place. Okay. So all of our ability to schedule, kind of, if you think about it from executive function, it's that CEO of our mind. Right. Okay. Yep. So he, because of his injury, he lost that. He was no longer able to function as a manager. He basically became a beggar, if you will, hmm. because he, he had lost that executive function of his brain, which we understand, but yet he became belligerent and just kind of a drunkard, that kind of thing in that day. And we, we, his, his skull is still in, you know, some museum somewhere hmm. that basically, and that began this process that we are kind of learning further about today was that certain parts of the brain do certain things and you know and there's other parts you know where, where we'll talk about that you know um if you not necessarily of a design perspective you know reptilian brain mammalian brain that kind of thing but you know it's going to be a process of primary function our lower back where all all of our senses are connected and then our executive function and when we can keep our executive... When he said lower back, he was pointing to the lower back part of his skull. Not, yes. Not, he, not my, he's not, not saying <laughs> part of your brain is in your lower back. Yes, my upper neck, <laughs> lower lower back of my head. But yeah. yes, that's where primary function is. I just figured is. I'd draw the picture I, for I that you're so it. eloquently drawing with your hand motions. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, it's that ability to recognize, okay... I've been designed this way for a reason. And, and the reality of it is the designer knows the purpose and we're just catching up with it. And mm -hmm. I, cause, um, you can actually, if you don't mind, um, Deuteronomy 30, 19 mm -hmm. oh, really? is it, is another, is another, uh, area because I like what it, what it says. And that's just one example. When we think about going back, that's one example where we can say, okay, God is encouraging us to choose and he gives us this process. If you want to read that one, that's a, that's a good one. <laughs> uh, I don't think that's the one. What, what, what Deuteronomy 30, 19, 30, 19. I yeah. had 2013. Okay. Which talks about putting all its males to the sword. <laughs> uh, I don't think that's what you, I'm uh, sorry. Uh, 30, 30, 19, 30, 19. I'm getting there. It's okay. Sorry. I didn't mean to uh, put you on the spot there. No, you're good. And it's going to put me on the spot if suddenly this is, <laughs> and all their males were put to the sword again. <laughs> uh, okay. Yep. I call heaven and earth 
to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Mm. Therefore, choose mm -hmm. life that you and your offspring may live. Mm -hmm. You want me to keep going? No, that's fine. I mean, but that's the process. In other words, there's God is given us heaven and earth is this witness that we have the ability to choose mm. and we get to choose each and every day. And sometimes it is a matter of choice between blessings and curse. Because mm. sometimes curses are handed down to me mm -hmm. from the third and fourth generation. Yes. But that's not to say that's who I have yes. to be. I can choose blessing yeah. and I can choose life. Yeah, and it's it's so important to understand the realities of those things because that's the uh, kind of the impetus for the choosing, right? So yes. if I understand those patterns that are in me inherently due to those that genetic code passed down, well, now I know I have to do the work to override those things more so than maybe my spouse or, or you know, whoever, my friend. But knowing that that's the case, I think a lot, a lot of times really helps, which I, which is again, going back I can't help it. I always go back to the principles of recovery and stuff like that. But the first step is denial. Sure. The first principle, the first mm -hmm. uh, lesson is denial. And because until I admit that I have that thing, sure. You know, in this case, we're going to say a pattern passed down my, from my parents or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Genetic code. Um, until I can understand it, admit that there's no moving forward, right? Sure. And so I do. I do think you can try to not admit that 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 is inherent in my genetic code and still do choose, mm. try and choose around that and, and go forward. I think the problem with that is that it's a little bit of an ignorant stumbling. If sure. you don't know exactly the path you want to avoid and which will help and guide and direct the path you want to take. Sure. Is that fair? And I think it's very fair. And I think in addition to that, what you're, if, if I'm hearing you correctly, what you're saying is that we have a choice or I'm, what I'm hearing is we make a choice each day, whether we know it or not mm -hmm. in many ways, mm -hmm. when we follow the pattern, mm -hmm. if, even if it's in ignorance, we're still making a choice mm -hmm. to follow Versus that ability that I have to say, okay, is this what I want? Is this the behavior yes. that I desire to continue in? I think that could be a polarizing statement, right? Yeah. That I'm, you're choosing to do the bad thing. But if you consider... It's by default. Right. If sure. you consider the fact that you can choose otherwise. Yes. Right? Well, now you have to recognize that the path you were on is also a choice. A, yes. Like you said, a default choice, sure. Right. But still a choice. And again, I think that ties very nicely into a lot of the, you know, stuff with recovery in terms of like denial and saying, I, you know, I can't fix yep. it. It's, it's beyond me. It's just who I am or whatever. Okay. Yep. You're right. Because that's the decision sure. you're making. And yeah. And from my perspective, um, as you were sharing, I'm thinking still in that it is a we we do have a choice which comes back to free will. This is what makes it polarizing. Because mm -hmm. if I'm saying that, I have to recognize, okay, either I do or I don't have a choice sometimes. But my free will, it gives me the opportunity to choose. Mm -hmm. And that's where, from my perspective, that's where the epigenetics comes into play. Mm -hmm. Because I can realize some of these things have been passed on to me. And when, and it, this is, this is part of, um, I'm going to call this the uh, psychological part of that denial. Okay. Cause so often what happens is decisions we make, okay, are based on our subconscious. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's not necessarily yes. up into, if I, I'm, I'm putting my hand here and I got a hand mm -hmm. above and I got a hand below. So when I put my right hand below my left hand, that's subconscious. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what, what my thoughts do, what my brain does 
is anything that's in subconscious is still available to me, available to me. It becomes the neural pathways that my mind, that my brain operates in. Okay. That's subconscious. And what my brain does is it looks back at all of the the patterns that have been demonstrated, all the modeling that I've seen, and it tends to make that decision for me. Okay. But each time Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's very similar to our communication. Okay. Now you and I, (laughs) we typically listen to this at one and a half because our communication tends to occur slower than we might like. Okay. But in communication, good communication, it can take up to seven to 10 seconds for a person who's actually listening Mm -hmm. to respond to me. Mm Mm-hmm because I'm actually processing that. Mm -hmm. So when I gain awareness, okay, that seven to 10 seconds is still available to me in every choice I make. But when I gain awareness of it, I bring it up into my consciousness and therefore I've gained awareness. And because I have awareness, now I choose differently what to do with that same seven to 10 seconds Mm -hmm. that has been an automatic neural pathway practically beforehand. Does that make sense? It does. And that kind of ties into the meditation side of things, right? In the sense that you're trying to slow down and require the subconscious things to move up. Yes. Into the layer where you are actively manipulating those thoughts. Sure. Right? Yes. Yes. To where I'm actively making a different choice. Mm -hmm. And that is actually rewiring my brain. Yeah. And it's, and it's interesting because, you know, I tend to think of positive and negative thoughts. Okay. Some would say, um, I would even say ha, um, healthy or toxic thought. Yeah. Okay. If I continue in a pattern of toxic thought, it's going to affect how I think. Okay. That's, that's the reality. And I, and I'm, and I'm. This is part of the neat part and the freeing part for me is that I recognize how much of the influence we have around us propagates toxic yeah. thought. Mm-hmm. There's not enough. Mm. You know, there's this um, scarcity mindset as we've talked about before. You know, mm. there's not enough. There can't be enough. You know, there's only there's only only so many resources in the petri dish, and you know, and we're gonna use them all up. And you know, and it's like, I'm not sure. I'm mm. well. I know I'm not. I'm sure that that's not the case. Right. And yet, that becomes the promotion. And it's interesting to me because I'm I'm hearing if if we're gonna come back. To the aspect and, you know, here again, credit to Mary Beth and Mary Ellen for doing this hard work. But if we're going to come back to roughly 70 to 85 percent of our health is actually affected by how we think. Okay, Mm, yeah, I'm going to recognize that we are seeing that I am actually seeing in my small scale. I am seeing more and more teenagers who are wrestling with anxiety. Mm-hmm. I am hearing more and more about younger kids who are are who have cancer. And from my mind, I'm automatically going there and saying, okay, what are we continuing to promote? And how is it really affecting the health of our our young young adults mm-hmm. and kids in this process that, you know, I just, and it still comes back to scripture for me because God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. You know, he's given us a spirit of love. And when we're able to- Power and love and a sound mind. Sound mind, yes. Thank you for the rest of Mm -hmm. that. That ability to be able to say, okay, I don't have to live in this fear. I don't have to live in this anxiety. And yet that's not judgmental because I recognize how people- who have experienced, you know, tremendous hurt, you know, they can get caught in that cycle of thinking and fear and ruminating in such a way that it captures them. Hmm. Yeah. And yet, 
you've experienced it. I know I've experienced it where, you know, people who have the ability to process that and say, okay, that's not who I am. That's not who I, that's not what I want to choose to think about. Mm -hmm. And we can see that transformation that occurs. That's, that's where this comes back to for me. Yeah, and what you're describing, again, is that pat pattern of the world. Yes. Right? Yes. And, you know, I think growing up when I would hear these verses, I would immediately think, like, just don't be such a sinner. Like, yes. <laughs> like, don't think about sinful things, uh, which, of course, I think it means that as well. But I'm saying it is saying all of those things, like this pattern that we get stuck in our brains. Yes. Right? This fear. Um, this limited mindset, you know, just all the things that you were describing is, is the pattern of the world and it doesn't align with the pattern that he has for us, exactly. which is why, again, it kind of comes back to the surrendering of that, which is that, uh, you know, living sacrifice. It says mm -hmm. living sacrifice specifically because number one, we're not required to die <laughs> to be the sacrifice. And number two, it's active. Yes. It's not a passive effort. It's an active effort to which kind of goes back to that daily mindfulness kind of that same, ties right back into the same science that we're finding. Right? Sure. That it's a daily effort to continue to transform that brain. Yes. Right? Re replacing the, the default patterns that were handed down to me through my genetics. Yes. That are ever present in every situation I'm in. Like how many, you know, 90% of our interactions throughout the day, you're going to see a pattern exhibited mm. that doesn't align with healthiness. Sure. Correct? Wouldn't you say? 90%? 90, that 90% is a very high number. <laughs> I okay. I don't think there's, I don't think you can put a number on it. The point is, it's all around us, right? You go to the gas station and someone's upset at the cashier. Sure. Or, you know what I mean? You go to the, um, yeah. I, I, will, I, I will say, statistically speaking, 85 I believe it's 85 to 90% of the thoughts that we think are the same as yesterday. Yeah. So unless wow. we're actively, you know, challenging those thoughts, we are going to tend to repeat the same behavior as the day before. Mm -hmm. But each day we choose a different journey affects that 80 to 95, 80, 85 to 90%. Yeah. And, and the, In, the neat part I like about what you're saying is we can recognize, because as I understand this process, okay, not that sin isn't an issue, okay, but it's become less of an issue for me because as I look at this, okay, I'm better from my perspective, I see God in what he is doing and I see his grace and I see mm -hmm. his mercy mm -hmm. that basically he understands every choice I make and why I'm making it mm -hmm. based on what has been handed down to me. Okay. He understands it and yet he still provides a way out of it. Mm -hmm. So it, it's just, it's mm -hmm. just transformed the fact that, you know, I, and it, it, it brings to light that aspect of, as I see it, Satan is the father of lies. Okay. And it brings that, um, oh, what's the word when some temptation, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. My pleasure. <laughs> it brings temptation to mind because we're surrounded. We can be surrounded by lies. Mm hmm but we can also challenge those lies with the truth in such a way that is grace filled. Mm -hmm. And it, it just, it just transforms for me that perspective, not in a, not in a arrogant sense, but here again, coming back to the awe that I have for God, that he knows all of it mm -hmm. and he provides us a way out of it. Right. And we have a choice. Just like he's given clear back in Deuteronomy, just like he gave, you know, everyone choose this day whom you will serve, you know, choose to be courageous, be strong and courageous, you know, all of that. It's, it's like he's still speaking that same way to us today mm -hmm. 
as he did to Moses and Abraham and, you know, all, and Caleb and, you know, all those people who did those things, I think in some ways they have that, they might've felt that very same way that I'm doing right now, right then. Mm-hmm. You follow oh, me? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah that's, that's, that's yeah. the grace filled part for me. Yeah. And, you know, speaking of polarizing things as mm-hmm. we do, you know, you mentioned sin and it's not, you know, quite as, uh, however you described it. And my thought about that is that, we really, really want clear definitions of sin. We want to know, is that mm. thing a sin or not? Can I sure. can I do that thing? Yes. Right? Up to that fence. Where right. is the line? Right. Where are the lines? Sure. So where it's, it's, it's sin or it's just uh, depression. Sure. <laughs> it's sin or it's just worry. Sure. It's sin or it's just... Um, the tacos. You know, yeah. <laughs> the tacos, right. I, and... I think I'm with you, but I I, I want to phrase it maybe a different way to mm. say that I think there's a lot more, <laughs> depends on how you want to define sin, but essentially that subconscious layer and that genetic code passed down to us that says, you know, when someone offends you, punch them in the face. Mm-hmm. Sure. <laughs> That's what we call our flesh. Sure. Okay? This yeah. is This is why we're uh, from birth in mm. need of something better, bigger stronger, purer than us. Sure. Because from the get-go, we don't have even the level of, quote-unquote, righteousness that we need to, yes. to accomplish, you know, w- w- what needs to be done. Um, and I think that's so important to understand that, like, even our tendencies towards, you know, behaviors that are harmful to us. Sure. Like worry. We want to be really careful and not offend people to say your worry is not a sin. We we don't want to say that. But at the same time, I don't think I think we we spend too much time defining what sin is and mm. spend not enough time trying to transform our mind, right? Like sure. trying to think his thoughts and stop thinking our thoughts. And I would mm. argue if 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 the choice is my thoughts versus his thoughts, you know, there's a pretty high likelihood there's yeah. some sin in there, whether you, you know, whether I want to call my depression sin or not. Like, if I can't shake my beliefs and my thoughts and sure. replace them with his, then I'm going to argue that that's a sinful position. I Does that you. make sense? Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I appreciate and your clarification. That's kind of what I was I, wanting to convey in a, in a not ego egocentric or, you know, egotistical manner that, you know, sin doesn't matter. I don't, hmm. but I, uh, you, you said it very well. I guess. And part of the reason I want to, I, I choose to make that clarification for me as well is because when it's not as clear where sin is and it's more likely that I'm sinning more often than, than I'm willing to, un- to believe. Right. Sure. Well, now grace really matters. Sure. Right. And I do think that's where the Pharisees got it wrong. They're like, okay, we we drew the lines. You know, the fence was erected around our lives and we no longer allow sin in. Sin lives outside the fence. Yep. And Jesus is saying, You fools, you're whitewashed, you know, tombs. You're 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 dirty on the inside and clean on the outside. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so they clearly got it wrong, and we tend to get it wrong when we think, oh, that thing is the sin versus sin just kind of comes out of me, and sure. what needs to happen is I need to put him back in me yeah. to, to continually living sacrifice, sacrificially replace myself with him, you know, removing those old patterns of the world and allowing when I get rid of myself and allow him to come in through that surrender, through that daily sacrifice, well, now... He begins to renew my mind. Yes. Right? And so tomorrow, yep. 15%, I'm not thinking the same way. Exactly. Right? You said 85%. Yep. So there's 15% that on a daily basis we can tap into where he's transforming us so that my patterns slowly adjust over time. And I used to be heading this direction. I'm yep. pointing. Exactly. To my left. <laughs> and uh, over the course of some years of doing this daily work of transforming, allowing him to come in and transform 15% of my thoughts in that day, I'm now over here pointing this direction. Exactly. My mind has been transformed and renewed. Yes. Right? And I think that's uh, that happens 
when you recognize the need to continually suppress self, which sure. continually desires to fall into those patterns that I've been handed down and or are modeled right in front of my face. Like I was mm-hmm. saying, as you walk out into the world, it's like, oh, you know, or you watch TV, you watch news and you mm-hmm. see those patterns. All of that stuff is continually trying to become the default. Sure. Right? And we yeah. have to do the the work of that surrender. Yep. You know? And I and I I like the analogy you brought up with the, you know, the Pharisees. And we can recognize how for generations that had been etched in their thinking that was handed down, it was passed on. And when it came the moment to make a choice, they just they just didn't. You follow me? All of the, all the information was there, and it, and in some ways, it it's kind of similar to our our perspectives today. Because I think at times, and I I like the way you describe it in this transition to be more Christ minded. Because I think in our day and age, you know, we can have this aspect of open mindedness. Mm-hmm. You know, to where, and I think in some ways, you know, science is basically saying that, yeah, some of this open-mindedness may not be all it's cracked up to be either. Because the, this is this, you, what it reminded me of is <clears throat> individuals, okay, who were basically, who dealt with depression, okay, if they recited or repeated positive I statements yeah. over a longer period of time. It's affirmations essentially, right? Well, Is it- it's I statements. Yes. Okay. That I'm, uh, um, what's No, no, you're fine. Uh, what was the movie? Uh, the Help. Remember The Help where the, uh, the, the maid was telling the little girl, you are kind, yeah. you are beautiful. You, you know, there was, you were strong, you know, well, that was an affirmation. Yeah. Okay. But if I'm taking it from an I standpoint, I am strong, I am kind. Research says that basically doing that doesn't make a person better. Hmm. It actually can be counterproductive Hmm. because when they're, it's, it's just about me. And what it, what it does in some ways is it creates more cognitive dissonance. It's, it's where what I'm, what I'm, what I'm feeling doesn't necessarily align with what I'm thinking. But if I can transform and I recognize that I'm not the center of the universe, but there's something bigger than me Mm. in the center of the universe, that's when the transformation occurs. They actually were able to measure, okay, people with um, HIV, they were actually able to measure the amount, um, it was was a load, um, like, uh, what would negative things in your bloodstream be? Negative things. Yeah, it's in other words, like uh, um, when you're sick, you have too a, much iron. No, you have a higher level of um. Uh, it's oh shucks. I'm just gonna throw out blood words. Hemoglobin. <laughs> I think that's a good one. It's a long. <laughs> it's like like Mary Beth would have called offenses. The offenses. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna call it. I apologize. I don't have that. The word's not coming up to me. But they were actually able to measure the, it was a load. It was like things that- Offense load. Let's yeah, just go we'll call it. it the offense load, okay, in their blood system. And those who actually were able to recognize or admit that there is a loving God, okay, the load that, offense load actually diminished for them. They could measure that in their blood Mm -hmm. with people who had HIV Mm -hmm. to, and if, to where, if a person didn't have that feeling, it was like their, their, their levels kept climbing instead of dropping by that third. And it basically, and, and there again, that's part of the epigenetic process because we can recognize all um, twins are not the same person. Mm-hmm. There's those subtle differences that I make by choosing. Cause if it, if our brains were all, you know, machines, okay, no, no twin would ever be different. Cause they have the same genetic code, right? That's yeah. right. 
So they, so therefore, if they're the same genetic code and our brains are machines, those two individuals would continually be. Mm. But that's where epigenetics come in. Each person can make those subtle choices, and the and the child that is born three minutes ahead is going to have a different standing to a certain degree mm -hmm. than the the quote unquote younger twin. Mm -hmm. You follow me? Yeah. And all this, and it's just fascinating mm. when you think about that in that context of. You know, these are how powerful our choices mm -hmm. are and our environment mm -hmm. is, and yet we have this ability to choose it differently. And even down to the mm -hmm. food we consume, they did a, a study with mice, okay? Certain mice, um, agate, agate, agati mice, okay, tend to be yellow and they tend to be overweight or obese, mm -hmm. okay? But what they did... There's a, there's a complex name for it, but what they did was they gave them B vitamin before they mated. And just that influx of dietary dynamics changed the genetic code within those mice to where that next generation no longer str struggled to be fat and obese mm -hmm. just because of the B vitamin being introduced before they made it. And it, and it actually proves they've, they went on to do that and research how obesity is affected even in humans based on what we consume. Even, um, is it Noom? Are you familiar with Noom? Yeah. It's, it's that process to be able to recognize how certain foods I have mm. learned to be comfort foods for me. And when I'm transforming my thinking about what that food is and my need for it, it loses its hold on me mm. and I'm able to lose weight and do, and, you know, make different choices. Noom, if you'd like to sponsor us. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate those thoughts. <laughs> it's like, I'm not even close to that thought, but Justin brings it out. Right. And it's, I, I, I hear Mark talk and I hear, <laughs> cha-ching, cha-ching. <laughs> I appreciate that, Justin. Like you say, somebody needs to be thinking on the cha-ching part of this deal. But yeah, it's just fascinating to that me. Cool. And it And it's just that mm -hmm. process of choosing. Mm -hmm. Not only, and it's it's not about, and it, here again, it comes back to you. It's not necessarily about positive thinking. It's about the mind of Christ, and this is a mm. choice that we have. Mm -hmm. And I think it comes back to me mm. when I have choices, mm. when I recognize that, yes, I was born a certain way, but that's still a choice to me today. That also, I'm also mindful of the responsibility that goes along with that. Mm -hmm. Because if I was, if I'm, if I'm thinking that I was just born that way and therefore that's my excuse, that's going to seem mighty frail mm -hmm. at some point in my life. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, I've lived my entire life thinking, I didn't have a choice. And suddenly I'm going to become aware that, oh, shucks, mm -hmm. all along I had a choice and therefore I'm now responsible for the choice that I right. make. And it, and it, and it's, and it's convicting to me as an, as a parent, because I realize I'm passing some of my stuff onto my kids yeah. just through the epigenetics, that, that gene process. And yet I want to be making choices today. Well, once they left the holster, you aren't going to change that epigenetic <laughs> code. So. You're, you're not. <laughs> I'm not changing. You now switch to nurture. I'm not changing the gene pool that was passed on. Okay. <laughs> but yet by relationship, I can help redefine some of the choices yeah. that they make mm -hmm. based on what I'm modeling. Yes. And that's that's part of that responsibility, conviction in a positive sense mm -hmm. for me to be able to say, okay, yep. And it and it's just, yeah. I, th I, I mean, a lot of what you're talking, or what we've talked about today, I really do think does tie back to this conversation about nature versus nurture. And I think, <clears throat> you know, there are, there are camps that believe way more in nurture and way more in nature, right? Sure. I, I mean, I think I feel like everything we're talking about here is it is both. 
Sure. <laughs> you know, and yes. there is very much a nature aspect to who we are, the genetic con- code, right? Sure. And the problem is when we don't see that, mm-hmm. um, and it remains on that subconscious layer, well, it becomes deterministic, right? Like, sure. I am nature. I am what I was handed down, and I am, you know, I can't change that. But as we've discussed, no, you absolutely can. There's no end to science to show that there is the ability to transform that nature, right? Sure. Those, those, that genetic code that says you should be X, people can change that. Yes, right? indeed. And that can come through nurture, right? Like mm-hmm. parenting, as you're describing to say, oh, oh crap, I handed down uh, a, a, a quick temper. Sure. Right? Well, alcoholism. Right. Alcoholism, right. What can I do now in the nature side of things to, to or excuse me, nurture side of things mm-hmm. to start nurturing? Okay, listen, you're going to have a tendency towards a quick temper, but here's how we deal with that. Or here's sure. how we, you know, here are the steps to address that. And slowly they they can adopt some of the changes you've taken your whole life to learn sure. and start learning from, you know, as a parent handing down in this nurturing system, right? Yeah. Teach them to how to address that thing. And if you if they do that over the course of their lifetime, by the time they get to their kids, it's a different beast, right? Yes. Even the genetic code likely that they're passing down exactly. is transformed. Yes. To a degree. And you continue that through the generations. Um, I, yeah, it's pretty incredible, which is why, again, going back to the Bible about to the second and third generation, there is a, a point where yes. that code has been, um, the iniquity has been ended. Yeah. And I'm will. trying to think of the, the term when you add, uh, diluted. Okay. Right? Diluted. Sure. So there's been enough mixture of other genetic code and nurturing and all these things that mm. it doesn't mean that the third generation is fine and good it means likely that specific bit that was so strong has sure. been diluted to this point to where i i don't know i just i and think i apologize because i'm gonna do you remember where that verse is to the second and third to the second and third I generation real quick because i want to say there's more to it right because i want to say third and fourth generation but if once we're transformed, it can be passed on to the a longer period of time. In other words, it it says you know cursing will be third and fourth generation, but a blessing can continue on and on and on. If I'm recalling that correctly, you able to find it? It's okay. I'm still looking. Yeah, because uh, that's yes. Uh, I'm coming back to that nurture and nature part of it. Yes, is is our ability to be able to say, okay, either I do have a choice and I'm responsible for that choice, or I'm a victim and therefore I can't choose anything differently. And I think that's that's part of that difference when we see it that way. He's getting close, folks. Man. <laughs> this is this this is another thing, Justin, I, I have to admit. I have as as I've uh, recognized choices, I can admit that I have become less technology averse. Uh-huh. I have. I because I new neural pathways. I I am creating Just new neural pathways due to your neuroplasticity. I yes. Well done. I, I'm trying. <laughs> uh yes. Well, so this is Exodus twenty five. Okay. Um, the Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and the fourth generation. So third and fourth, not second and third. Yeah, but I I want to say there was a part that went even sh- further on. Um, there's another visiting iniquity. Um, yeah, there's several verses <laughs> about <laughs> visiting the iniquity. Of the fathers and the children and the children's children to the fourth and third and fourth generation. Uh huh. Does um, there anything after that? After that verse? Third and fourth one, generation. Two, three. So far, there's four verses with that in it. Okay. Five verses. I gotcha. It's okay. Well, I think it's very interesting. Uh, because yeah. I want to say there was one of them that almost made it, you know, if you challenge that 
that process, if you choose differently, you know, yes, it will, you know, that, that iniquity can last for the third and fourth generation, but blessing will continue on even further is what. Yeah. I would have to click through each of these. Yeah. It's okay. Don't worry about it. That was my bad. I should have. I think, um. It just kind of came to me in the middle of uh, our our discussion. Whether it's tied to these scriptures or not, mm-hmm. we we know it's in, certainly in the New Testament in terms of uh, Jesus allowing that, right? So sure. essentially, whatever was in the past, yes, the minute we take on salvation, can be erased. Now, sure, you know, then it goes to all the work of the, mm-hmm. the daily, you know, living sacrifice concept. Um, but yeah, sure. Yes, it's it's it's, uh, it's very interesting, and I love any conversation or you know any, any time that science, like you said, catches up. Yes, and you know none of this stuff is mind blowing when you think about hey, people can change. You know, sure. it's like okay, we've known that for centuries. I mean, these scriptures were written. Yes. How, many, how many centuries ago, right? And uh, I, and I think so much. This is this is I. I think huh, the uh, the the sermon you mentioned, you know, it talked about um, sacrifice always um, being paid off or being worth it. You know mm. that that there's there's a sacrifice, and the price is always worth as was it being paid. Now we can wrestle with that, okay? Because I'm you know I don't typically think in absolutes, but I will say that I think much of what we... You never think in absolutes? I try not to think in absolutes. Yes. Um, that was a joke. And, and I apologize if I did say never. I, I know. You didn't. Okay. I just wanted to okay. trap you. And you got out of that smooth. Like <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't get trapped for that. Well, I'm still, and I'm still holding my train of thought, but what the, uh, the interesting part for me is when we think about sacrifice and the ability to, you know, it comes at a sacrifice and, you know, the, what was communicated, it is always worth the, I can, I wrestle with that as a human, but I also will, um, recognize where so much of this information has come from uh, about neuroplasticity. And I think a lot of it has to do with TBIs. And I recognize there are a lot of armed forces people, you know, who have, you know, experienced, you know, improvised ex- ex- IEDs, IEDs. Yes. For those of us who don't know the acronyms. Um, TBI. Oh, traumatic brain injury. Sorry, I apologize. An ID. Um, um, explosive device. In, oh. Improvised explosive device. So basically, IED. Our, yeah. IED. That's what I said. Correct. Yeah, that is. Yeah. yeah. I believe that's. Um, yes, I'm sorry. Thank you for the clarification. So I believe no, our armed forces have made a tremendous sacrifice. And I would recognize that much of what we know now mm. is a uh, uh, is has been paid at their expense, and yet I believe that in itself is demonstrating how God has made a way, even for people who have traumatic brain injury, that they can learn to do things again. Mm-hmm. Is it going to be hard work? Yes. Is it going to be, you know, difficult? Yes. Mm-hmm. But I think, you know, that's, that's where the freedom comes in from my perspective. And I, and I, and I just, uh, I just really can't disconnect that, um, the armed services and the freedom that we have mm-hmm. and how, um, the, you know, Christ basically offers each of us freedom and I'm, I'm mindful of the the cost that that was to him. And it wasn't so much that he benefited from it, but we did. And I think, you know, the, the analogy holds up, you know, the same way that as we learn more and more about our abilities, you know, the mind being over the brain and my ability to say, yes, I can, even when my body is fighting me, even when my brain has been injured, there's grace in that 
to be able to find a new way. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just, it brings back the Pharisees, you know, there's, and it, there was another quote, it basically, um, science is advanced funeral by funeral. Hmm. So it's, it's as we, you know, recognize that that isn't incorrect and we let it die, you know, science actually catches up with design. And I, I like that quote in a sense, because so often I have to, I have to die to self. I have to let go of some of those things that have been passed on to me by imperfect parents, just like my children will have to let go of some of the things that I've passed on to them because I was an imper imperfect parent. And for me, that's, that's the, the beauty of grace along with neuroplasticity. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's where I'm at. That's a pretty good way to see it, Mark. Well, that's how I see it. Hey, thank you for listening to our podcast. If you like How I See It, please do all the things that podcasts tell you to do. Subscribe, rate, review, follow us, uh, and or talk nicely about us on social media. If you want to reach out, the email is us at howiseeit.click. Yep, I said dot click, as in dot C-L-I-C-K. Please tell your friends about this show, and we'll see you on the next one.